fine. Should I start? Yes, please. Okay, so I'm a staff regular failure of Lahu, and I'm going to give a presentation on bivariate trend calculus. And we're going to go through two showcases of gold versus oil price and gold versus the S&P 500 index. But first, we need to give some, uh, we need to give like a brief uh, presentation of the trend calculus algorithm by Andrew Morgan. And we're going to start off with some trend definitions. And specifically, a trend is defined as rising if it has higher highs and higher lows, and falling if it has lower highs and lower lows. In addition, we can quantify this definition by assigning the values plus one for rising trends and minus one for falling trends. Uh, what we mean about these higher highs and higher lows for the rising trends, for example, can be seen in these graphs over here. Um, so now we're going to look at the basic steps for the trend calculus algorithm. First, we want to stream the data across a fixed window size. Then for each window, we want to identify the dated high and lows. And then depending on the order of occurrence of these highs and lows, we want to summarize each window as a rising window or a falling window. Lastly, we want to compare this summary of the current window to the previous window. So here we illustrate rising windows in green and falling windows in red. So the next step is we want to assign a value for each window. And the way to do, to do that is by using the trend calculus equations in here. So given this equation, we assign a sign to each window. We assign the value of plus one for rising windows, for example, the second one, and minus one for falling windows, for example, the third and the fourth one. So naturally, now we come to the definition of a reversal, which is a point on the previous window where the trend flips meaning that we're going from a rising trend to a falling trend or the other way around. So here are the rules to find this reversal point. And specifically, if the trend moves from plus one to minus one, meaning from rising to falling, then the previous high is the reversal. And for the other way around, the previous low is the reversal. So now we have the output of the algorithm and this output is a new time series that includes just the reversal points. So we can see here that, for example, if we take the second and the third window, we're moving from a rising trend to a falling trend, and we have established and circled the previous high, which is the reversal. So now we have a time series of trend change points. We can use this time series uh, again, as an input to the algorithm in iteration in order to find reversals of higher order. This way, long-term trends can be established. What's worth mentioning is that with this implementation, no information is lost since every higher order reversal is also a lower order reversal. For example, if we have a reversal that has the order of five, then that same reversal has the order of four, three, two, and one. So this stacking of trend calculus provides an efficient solution on finding high order reversals. On its iteration performed, the data is reduced until no points are available or the requested number of points are summarized. So now we're gonna move on to our first showcase, which uh, represents the main representations of the large uh, commodity markets. The first one is oil price and the other one is gold. Regarding oil price, we're using the financial time series for Brent crude oil. And according to the Economic Research Journal, 
Increasing oil prices can lead to inflation. Regarding gold, gold has been seen as the most uh, efficient safe haven in most countries by investors and is usually seen as a hedge against inflation. So the natural question that arises is if a change in oil price can be a predictor of a change in gold. And the answer is that over the long term, gold prices tend to move up and down in tandem with oil prices. So here we have created a graph representing these two financial time series of gold and oil. And we can see looking at the time frame that the values of these uh, financial streams are moving in a co manner. So now we're going to move on to our second showcase, which uh, is about gold and the Standard & Poor 500 index, which is a stock market index tracking the performance of 500 large companies across all industries in the US. It includes both growth stocks and value stocks, and it is often considered to be one of the best representations of the US stock market. We're gonna look specifically at the volume Armageddon, which basically is the largest one day drop in in history recorded for the S&P 500 index. And it occurred on the February of 2018. Despite the fall of the rest of the stock market indexes, gold improved. Generally speaking, stocks tend to benefit from economic growth and stability, while gold rises in terms of economic distress and crisis. So here we see the February of 2018. And if you look at the left of the graph, there is like a big red dot, which represents that exact fall of the S&P index. And if you look at the same time frame for gold, you can see that the immediate days afterwards, it started to rise. But overall, looking at the whole graph, you can see that these two financial time series are moving in the opposite direction, or in other words, they're negatively correlated. Historical data usually show that gold performs better than stocks in times of market downturn, but this is not always the case. The gold stock relationship changes over time, and there are periods where the two are in a co-movement. This co movement is uh, perfectly established during the COVID 19 outbreak. And specifically in March 2020, both the stock market and the gold market plunged. In addition, both markets rebounded in April of 2022. This co movement can be seen clearly in this graph over here. And if we look at March of 2020, then we can see that both time series started to fall rapidly. And then on April 2020, they started to move together, rising up constantly. So the next steps that we want to do is we want to take the output in time series with the reversals from trend calculus, and we want to implement them, to implement them as input to pathogen. So now Virginia is going to talk a bit about some improvements that she has done in pathogen library. So yeah, hi, I'm Virginia, and um, yeah, we started working with the pathogen library last week, and we, in order to understand the library and try to figure out how how it works, we created a small example uh, with a few events. Um, some of the events uh, are um, yeah overlap over time through time, and some of them are not uh, overlapped. So we using this example, we learned how to how to how the library works. Uh, we um, apply the rooster and the sun uh, to this uh, little example, and uh, we have the output, which is a graph with the values of the aggressiveness and sensitivity that uh, shows us if the if the um, events are uh, causes or cause uh, the previous events or the following events. So yeah, 
Uh, we also do um, some did some unit tests to prove if, uh, if the rooster and sun uh, inputs and outputs uh, had the um, the correct format and values for this uh, little uh, example that we did. Um, since we um, want to use this in Databricks and our cluster is uh, in uh, Scala 12, 2.12 and SPAR 3. One, two, we needed to upgrade the library to these uh, versions. And we also fixed some problems with the loggers that we had. Uh, I can show you later a, a notebook where we have uh, this example applied, but that here is where we are right now. And as Rafaela mentioned, we want to connect this with the, with the financial streams. So that's it from us. Yep. From now. Do you have any questions? Wow, that was great. Thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you. So we will, uh, you know, Antoine probably will catch up the video later and uh, plug us back. So currently we are working on the Lamastex fork of Amand pathogen. Uh, and uh, when we are happy, uh, I have to do code reviews yet. Um, when we're happy, we'll make a pull request to Antoine so uh, he can do whatever he does on Maven, <laughs> but we will release the, the binary packages uh, locally tagged from the Lamastex fork of pathogen. Um, I don't have any questions because I've been working closely with them over the last couple of weeks. So I, 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 uh, I, I didn't know that much progress was made by both of you, that's great. But uh, the floor is open, so Liam and you guys can ask questions. Maybe we should move this, or you can move the chair here. So I can. Do you have any questions, Andrew? Um, in your presentation, you don't mention the um, edge cases for the calculation um, for trend calculus. Oh, with a zero. Yes, but yes, I, we I, actually I... have them in the appendix, but we didn't know how much time we will have for the presentation. Yeah. Uh, so I can mention something briefly that uh, what this algorithm does, because like the train calculus equation, sometimes it's going to yield zeros. So what we do is that we, we create this uh, data structure, which um, consists of four points, basically. The first high or low, the high, the low, and the second high or low. And then what we do in a window that we have zeros, we split that window and we use the previous window's second um, higher low and the next window's first higher low. So this way we don't have uh, zeros anymore. Yeah, so basically the highs and lows across the whole stream uh, that started off as fixed window size becomes an irregular partitioning of the time series. And so by leveraging that fact, we can actually overcome the zeros. Yeah, it took a long time to realize that. That's but that's, that's what you asked us, uh, Johannes, to do. That's what- Exactly, that's yeah. So yeah. so that's that's really the magic of the algorithm. And yeah, maybe I you have some magic. Magic, but I should yeah. point out that this whole, because they only have a few weeks, right? What was it, yeah. what, 12 weeks or 10 weeks? I don't know. So they are reaching their midpoint, not just, uh, these, these two, so they're in a group called financial streams, but we have uh, GDELT and a whole bunch of Twitter and a whole bunch of stuff. So all the students uh, are presenting next Friday, their midterm report, uh, and that'll be premiering on YouTube as well. So you can watch that later. But Andrew, what I wanted to point out is that they are working on the batch version of mm -hmm. this code. That's okay. Uh, of course, this is all streamable because Johannes sure. is on the streaming one as well. But the problem is that we didn't want to deal with uh, some some complicated things in pure streams because uh, because what we've done now is each of these tickers in FX one minute data, we have historical data up to last uh, summer sometime. And then each of those streams up to last summer, uh, we have written down we have exhausted it, right? So we have all the reversals. So there's these parquet files that are already pre-written and they're loading. And then the, the, the axis uh, alignment, right? Because gold and oil have different uh, Y values. 
So we simply do a, a min max mapping for each, uh, each stock up to the window you're looking at so that you can see them together. And then the min and maxes are shown yeah. in, the, in the graph, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get that. Yeah. Um, you know, the bigger problem is, is this is a question for you. So if we move this to the streaming context, which is where things will get interesting and applicable and actionable, right? The problem is this, something in the very past, right? will start increasing or decreasing its reversal as future points come into, right? So which means, you know, the, the streaming trend calculus uh, part, what Johannes did actually allows for all of this to, to automatically change, right? But then for any given point in time now, you will have the, the entire history, uh, you know, in, in this higher order reversals, right? But as long as we can use just the history that we've observed up to now, in any future actions, right, predictions or whatever, then everything should be fine, right? Yeah. So what, what I think if I summarize is that something you learn new today can teach you a lot about the past. <laughs> yeah. Right. We call that hindsight. And the algorithm has amazing hindsight. Um, a couple things. Um, Mathematically, why is this structure useful? When you take the output of trend calculus on one time frame and feed it back in, and then you feed it back in again and again, you end up with a, a decreasing number of reversals. And um, in the physical sciences, because I have a geography background, um, there is a guy named Horton who has Horton's laws. And there are horton strahler laws that set out something called a stream order and they studied river basins and they talked about the number of branches and rivers. And actually the river basins and, and uh, stream orders, um, God, his name is Tanaka or Tung Tanunka, I think his name is. There was a Japanese um, researcher who extended that work. Um, and what he found is that you, there's a general class of trees and that for river basins, for example, you can study the um, increasing number and frequency of reversals as you branch out to lower and lower reversals. Now we're doing it in reverse. We're starting at the lowest and moving up to the, like the single. So when you count reversals one, you mean the lowest group of branches with the most. So they would count it backwards, right? Um, however, um, that said, um, if, you if you just plot the frequency of the reversals by stream order, you should see a straight line. And that indicates that there's a fractal process going on, right? So that's a, it's a measure of, uh, it's, a, it's an H measure of fractality. Um, so I think there's a lot of really rich research to do about understanding the fractal order, uh, the stream orders themselves. And if there's any inferences we can make about the number of small reversals we see before we um, could estimate when a big reversal is coming. So there's a lot of interesting kind of research in that space. There's a team in Oregon, I believe, with a guy named Ilya Zalapan, um, who did a um, multi-trend, uh, multi-scale trend analysis paper, and he has a lot of good ideas. And his younger researchers, I believe, are are pushing on this um, tree-based stream order uh, mathematics. Would you kindly, uh, um, I don't know, send this? I'll send, I'll send, send you. I'll send you. Yeah. Because we have the paper by the three Russians that we read. Uh, last summer, you know, the one you gave us. Yeah. So, yeah, there, so that, that stream order piece is really important because actually it depends on the scale. So if we find that there's correlations on one time frame that are positive and negative on another. So your example with gold, um, there was a crisis. A crisis is short term. We see a short term alignment of gold and market prices. But in the long run, we don't see that correlation. OK, so it's a little bit like if you look at the ice age, you can see a correlation between CO2 and global ice. But on a day to day basis, you know, you don't see you see a, a different swing of patterns. So I think that when we look at different scales, we might find that there are short term periods of alignment and then misalignment. Um, but on a long, long time frame, we wouldn't see those. So I think it's important to understand the scale. And that was one of the pieces behind trend calculus that was important. Okay, so then my one thing we don't want to forget is, uh, so anyway, what we're doing is live research. Yes, <laughs> yeah. So if yep. so anyone can join anytime and contribute anytime. So uh, we will also release tech, tech uh, uh, 
LaTeX source code for stuff Johannes did so it can proceed faster. By the way, Andrew, what what uh, Virginia and uh, Virginia and uh, uh, Raquel need now is how do we encode the reversals from say one of these or all three time series uh, so that we can okay. plug it into pathogen because that there are many ways to do it and I I, I kind of want to to lead us <laughs> here. So um, you guys on your picture with the boxes. Um, at some point, you have to complete the window before you can assess the previous bar, whether there was a high or low. So this is a lagging indicator. And obviously, if you take the output of that approach and put it back in again, it means that the high and low in that window, say you have a window size of three, three reversals that happened off the first pass. Now that, that box size is of um, indeterminate length in terms of real time. Right, so the first reversal could be two years, right? You know, like so the the reversals themselves are dated in time, and sort of um, when you pass them into higher orders, those boxes are actually of of, of different width in terms of time. So um, it could be that you wait some time to confirm a reversal, and at the moment that you find that value, um, if you look at the way it's editing the arrays to mark off that history and what it learned. The, the date, the date of the information discovery, could be the close of your of your window. So I discovered in March that December previous was a major high in the stock market. The minute I discover that, um, I, I can take a long term action now. Up until that point, I'm I'm guessing, right, that it was. So the the moment from the actual reversal in the past. And the moment that I discovered it was a reversal, that's probably the window that you should use to do the connections. And you might want to add a little leeway on that because people might not have noticed right away um, and take an action. So there's an action. Period. I mean, I, I see what you're saying, but but how? I mean, I don't know because should we choose a range of reversals or should we do? Because if we do all reversals. No, um, I, I need to know. Antoine's what approach with news time series because news moves quite differently than stock markets. It's very spiky, so there's nothing, nothing, and then there's a big spike. Yeah. What he did was he took trend calculus, ran it over the data, and it looks like a heartbeat data set. Um, and he literally filtered out everything that was a low and only worked on highs. So he just halved the data set, filtered out all the lows. And then from a high point, then just put a, a boundary and said, well, two weeks after a high, what happened? Oh, right? So he did it that way. Who's he? Antoine. Oh, Antoine, yeah. Okay. So when we looked at the news, news sentiment, right. um, that's how we originally did that. Right. So again, um, I think it's probably worthy of study, right? So um, if you just take all the reversals in mind, um, if there's a, a, a 20, like a 20th order reversal, like a one in a hundred year reversal, you might want to put a five year window around that, right? If, if there's a, a reversal found on the daily or hourly basis or minutes, you, you want to have a commensurately smaller window. So if you just look at the start and end of each trend, so a low to a high or a high to a low, if you just had a straight line. So in other words, if you use trend calculus as a piecewise linear approximation, the length of the line, that would be the start and end of a trend, what I would call a trend. And you could just use those lines as the start oh, and end duration. Is that the slide you showed last video, the pathogen one? You had the slide where you had these linear lines connected. That's right. So you choose reversals of a given order for a particular time series, right? And then you join them up with lines. And that projects onto the timeline and interval for some, some, some event. And then yeah, you do the same with another time series and do the projection. Yeah. And now if those two intersect, then you link them in pathogen as an edge, right? That's right. So You're Antoine used it? so Antoine used start and end time for like the correction or fix of a, an IT problem, right? Oh, right, right, right. So if you imagine that uh, a major low rising to a major high, that I would call a straight line. I would call that a trend up. Um, and um, I would just take it on one on one time frame, and that would be the whole line. So once you've picked your time frames, I mean, you might want to trial all time frames, um, but then you could connect everything up that way. So um, connect the line. The time frame is defined by a, a particular the, order. Uh, an order, yeah. So pick a stream order, um, say the fifth one or whatever would be quite major. 
you filtered a lot of noise out and then you could look at the major at the time but it, it, imagine bitcoin will rise for three to six months and then crash in two and then it'll rise very slowly for another five years right <laughs> like or, or or stay stable so i think what these lines do is they kind of they have a slope um, and they have a duration and a very, very long duration isn't very useful for your analysis. You're looking for short durations. So should we say, for example, for concreteness, because uh, let's say we pick these three time series because there is some economic research saying that there is some yeah. meaningful relationship between oil, gold and uh, US S&P index, right? So we have uh, arbitrary all the orders for this batch data. So we, 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 and I think the other question also we were wondering, but we, we need to dive into this is sometimes series, you know, have a lot of reversals. Others may have fewer, right? Yeah. yeah. So then where it, it may or may not be possible to have the exact, you know, exact uh, numbers, right? Because this may have 18 and the other one may only have seven, let's say in the worst case, right? So in those cases, what would you do? Would you maybe choose the you know choose the time choose the reversal order <laughs> such that the induced yeah. time intervals are compatible right? um does that make sense so the answer the answer is um i gotta think about how to explain it succinctly all right so let's imagine right now you start with a very short window of just three observations and you do the first run then you do the second run the third run and you you're increasing the stream order as you go okay now if I look at all of the Dow Jones, there's something like 1,400 reversals or something large, 14,000. Um, and then every time you step up, there's a magnitude drop in the number being found. So at some point, you're going to find there's about 72, right? Now, if you have the same amount of gold data, you're looking for the time frame that gives you about 72 reversals. And it might be from a different order but the, the magnitudes of, of the number of reversals found is roughly the same. So I would say that you probably are finding stri striations, right? So stream orders with um, kind of count levels and um, for a fixed period of time, like 15 years, try to, try to marry them up uh, empirically. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think it makes some kind of sense to me. Are you following it, Rafaela? Yeah. yeah, kind of. Yeah. Well, that was your chance to monetize. If you, if you didn't, um, so maybe maybe we'll turn it around. So Virginia, um, Stavrola, what what questions have you got for me? So basically, we're gonna go looking for the time frames in a way so that the two time series have the same number of reversals. Yeah, for say, it's just pick a decade. And then try to find out if there's 20,000 reversals in oil at a very low level. Try to find the um, stream order that has the, uh, also 20,000 reversals, mm -hmm. right, for the financial series. Now, um, some things move very slowly, and some things move very quickly, and this is a, a volatility measure. So it could be that these get out of sync with volatility. I don't know. I, I think it's to study. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe yeah, I think we right get there. the main idea. Yeah. Implementation will show if we really get it. Yeah. Um, on on these trees, um, this is a mathematical side sidebar, but I'll just tell you my my latest research in them and looking at these stream orders. Um, so I've been looking into something called L systems. I don't know if you've ever heard of L systems. There was a guy. Um, in the late 60s and 70s who came up with L systems in biology and it's a mechanism for drawing plants. And uh, it uses a language um, called turtle and turtle draws things. And he came up with a set of rules that are replacement rules um, for drawing leaves and ferns. That is the backbone of all of our CGI that we use in all of our movies now. And um, the way that he builds L systems is very similar to these um, stream orders. Um, and so I'm thinking that, you know, he's come at the problem that I'm tackling. So I'm reverse engineering the stream orders from data and he's generating that complexity using rule sets. But he, he, he does this by specifying, please do recursion to level 15 deep. In other words, he's setting the stream order up as part of the parameters for generating the fractals. 
and, and I'm reverse engineering them out. <laughs> so I think that there's an interesting um, play. I will send you some material about that. But, um, yeah, please do. I think that's very interesting. very interesting. Yeah, but L Systems uh, by Lindemere, I think, is, um, he's Nordic. He, he's probably written a lot of stuff um, that mm -hmm. you have in the library for sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy. Uh, we have enough to do, I think, for the next two weeks, right? Virginia and- Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. <laughs> um, one last thing is that um, a lot of the, the thinking behind these trend calculus, okay, so I was trained in a uh, technical analysis by market practitioners who trade, and they believe in something called Elliott wave theory um, it's not recommended, like I, I don't recommend in the academic community you make a, a huge study about Elliott Wave Theory because it's, it's largely denounced by everyone as hocus pocus. However, I worked with some people who believe in Elliott Wave Theory and they believed that they were able to objectify this methodology by objectively finding reversals that counted off Elliott Waves. And when they taught me the methods, when I generalize them into mathematics, then we, we end up with trend calculus. Um, so the feeling is, is that um, connecting a low and a high together into a trend is very important. They feel, for example, the next trend will be of a Fibonacci ratio to the first one, right? So if it rises by 100, it'll fall back down by 68, um, you know? So that's how, how they talk about golden ratios in the stock market, not by the dots, but by the lines that connect them. Yeah. There's a lot of um, interesting um, analysis that you could do with the reversals you find, and it could be that those relationships only, only hold on one set of stream orders. Now, my own understanding is, is that the dynamics at the short end of the market, like minutes and seconds, is really different than days. And I would always use a daily chart for my stuff um, because I'm looking at long-term patterns. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, the dynamics at the short scale are very different. By the way, on a, on a side note, Andrew, I should remark that the, uh, the GitHub repo has a citation and uh, I, I forgot what it's called. I think it's called Trader Perceived Interval Value. Time Something like that, yeah. Models. And the reason I've said that is because I'm interested in the signals about what traders perceive is happening. And the trend calculus, this is a starting point, but I think you've, you've sent me a whole bunch of stuff from the trading blog eating is and there yeah they have all this rising dragon and bear claw and eagle and all this sort of complicated formulae that they believe in right using fibonacci ratios and so those i think ideally you know eventually we would like to add to this library so that all trader perceived events yeah. are actually encoded right it's not yeah. that that's real or not it's just yeah. it's a market it's a it's a big um, fear based thing right what, what i think you're saying is that the market is a it's more and more becoming automated, but even the rules are based on what humans believed before. Yeah. Um, so if there are, if there's a psychology element to the stock market, then all the perceptions play into what yeah. people are doing, right? Oh. Yeah. So um, yeah, I think there's uh, a lot of rich avenues of, um, of study with this trend calculus. Um, just um, the most practical, useful thing it does is it, it gives you a streamable piecewise linear regression. Um, or an approximation from one that's very good. Um, and that, that's really important to a number of physical sciences as well, because other people who use that um, as an alternative to wavelets, for example, it's always a, a reduction. It's always take the longest view and then subdivide it and do something and then subdivide it. And so if you get one new data point, you have to rerun the entire analysis. So if you wanted a piecewise linear regression, this paper I've put to you in the chat, for example, if you get one new data point, you have to rerun the entire analysis and it could take you know, hours to rerun that. Um, whereas my stuff, although it's a bit um, less precise maybe to their view mm -hmm. or less mathematical, it streams and it's super high performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very, very fast. No, I think that's, uh, I'm, I'm just quickly taking a, uh, what do you call it? His name is Ilya Zaliapan, I think. Oh. Okay. Yeah, thanks for the link. Um, yeah, look at his- um, Oh yeah, this one. This one is the, 
This is the one we... He actually specifies the equation for uh, the overlaps between uh, time series that are piecewise linear regressions. Oh yeah, this is the one we read last summer. Um, I think with the work that the girls are doing here, you might want to just reread the sections on how to <laughs> calculate the overlaps. Yes, I think that's that's a good homework for uh, uh, for us, Virginia, Rafaela. We should read this. You guys have been coding so much; it's time to kind of do some maths now. I think. <laughs> that would be so, nice. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Now, um, I, I produced this indicator on TradingView. I, I bumped you a link for us. I'm going to send it to everyone on the call. Um, and whereas the trend calculus focuses on the extremities of those windows that we looked at, the highs and lows, um, it's an analysis of the middle, and meaning that you can't get to a higher low without passing through the middle. And so when I do that analysis, I'm really trying to shorten the time to guess whether a, re a reversal is happening before the confirmation comes in. Um, but it's um, presented really beautifully in Trader View, and a number of um, people I know are now liking it. So I've sent that over to you. You guys can have a little play with that. But um, if you were going to look at Bitcoin, for example, you could see whether you know my indicator says it's up or down, then you can watch it for a while and see what really happens. And did you send uh, it to the chat also, or is that a, the email you send later? Or um, I'll send it over to you. I, I can send it to you in the chat. Um, hold on a sec. Or email is better because the PDF you sent last time for pathogen one, yeah. I will I will add that to the to the thing. We'll remember, we'll remember to add that because that's where I think you you actually have this uh, you know piecewise linear lines that are connecting the same order trends, right? I think you sent yeah. the PDF you presented last time. Yeah. Um, if I just kill this, I'll tell you what I can flash it up on the screen. Uh, so I called it trend calculus. I'll just I'll put it up there for you. Um, but I will show it to you so you can see if I share the screen. Uh, which screen am I sharing? I have like 200 screens. Here we go. Okay, so if I if I actually just drop that out. Okay, so we're looking at, uh, let's just look at something we all understand. So let's just go to uh, Bitcoin. Everyone talks about Bitcoin. It's very topical. Okay, everyone wants to know, is the recent high from a month ago, is it the long-term high? Or is it going to go back down or is it going to go up? So when we look at the chart, can you guys see that chart? Yeah. Okay, it's it's un, it's indeterminate what direction it's going. So if I go into daily, I'm going to have to just move my mouse around a bit. Well, I'll put in four hours because that's a good one. And if I go to indicators on trading view and I type in trend calculus, you'll see there's a community script which I've um, published open source. And it comes up with some parameters. So first of all, in here, you can click on dark theme, and then you can go into here, and we can go dark color theme, and it'll look nice and clean, or you can get rid of that. So there's some like just some little hygiene things in there that are useful. But most useful thing here is if uh, we turn that off for a sec. If you notice, uh, if I zoom in a bit, uh, can I zoom in a bit? You can see that it gives you a color coded bar that tells you the general trend. And this is a comparison of the previous bar and the current bar. And I use rolling windows and I look at the space between the center lines of those. And I have some math in there, um, really simple to just build me a window. And what you see is that um, you can't really have a reversal the way you guys are calculating it, calculating it unless the high here, it comes back down outside of this gray channel. So if the line crosses the gray channel and comes out the other side, this is a lagged channel. This is our previous window. This is the rolling highs and lows. So when it pops out, we know that there was a reversal on the previous high. So I would know right there that there's a previous reversal in real time, and I could use my eyeballs. And as soon as it pops up here, I know that this was a previous reversal. It goes up and as it falls down beneath this line, that's a previous reversal. But um, if you notice there's a faint green line, I call this the impulse factor. And if you were, well, first I can change the time frame, and you can see those windows get bigger. And if I were to make that 1.5, something really big, you can see that this line, it goes really much lower. And what it is, it's uh, a combination of the information in the middle stretched out. And it tells me if the trend is impulsing and continuing, what I expect the value of those trends to deliver. And as soon as I see a divergence, I can see the trend is about to change. It's no longer tracking the trend's impulse, it's changed. 
So I've been using this as well for various things. So, so sorry, the of, line is the part that you're inferring. So like um, at the bottom, is that correct? That's right. That's the impulse factor. So now this is so like at the bottom of this big one here, it, since it's since it's deviating. Uh, oh, it changed. How did it? Oh, change? um, I, I changed it. I, I can put it back. So uh, a score of it? one would be what I think the trend. Uh, the values that should be in the trend. And if it's on the, like, in, as it's falling, you can see this is oversold compared to what I think. And, and now it's rising above that line. Because that's the real data, right? This is the real data, yeah. So what does it say right now about Bitcoin? It says it's ranging in an indeterminate fashion, and bouncing off all the lines. I, You can see it's right, it's bouncing right off the lines. So these are lines of support and resistance, in other words, the pivots. Um, and if this were to go above the green line and break out of this channel, that would be a major low, and I would expect it to rise. Um, and we could we could see that. Um, just anyway, I, I, I might as well show you because I, I'm, I'm going to open it up. So I have been building things like strategies that take the data you see here, um, and these are not open source, but if I I haven't publicly put it out because I'm not sure that they work yet. Yeah, but... this is going to be on YouTube, so you have to decide. Okay. I'm not going to edit it like last time. It's, uh, it's okay, but if you if I just go in and see what you can do here, uh, you can see right here my algorithm goes long because it's crossed the center line, and then it goes up and it made a mistake, so then it sells because it gets nervous. So you can see I go buy and sell, but here I would go short and here I would go long, and you can see that um, on long trends here. I go long at the bottom and I track the green bar and I sell at the top. And if you're curious about whether that strategy works, uh, on a time frame of four hours, you can see I make 40%. Uh, I don't know on what the time frame is. If I go to daily, I think just out of the box, yeah, it, 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 it's 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 good, but it doesn't make a lot of money because of the trading fees. And also you have to tune it up, and this is not tuned. On, on some, uh, if you tune this up, you can get much better, much, much better. I think. Uh, <laughs> this is so cool, Andrew. I, I'm so nervous. Uh, I'm actually going to invest in land by a lake up north <laughs> <Anyway>. in Spain. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, so the point about all of this is that actually, if you uh, really were interested in trading it, you have to compare it to the buy and hold for Bitcoin. And you can see just buying and holding Bitcoin beats my strategy by a mile. <laughs> so it's not worth investing in the trading just so much. But anyway, um, I've, I've, I'll provide you a link, but you can find it on TradingView. It's called Trend Calculus, so it should be easy to find. And it uses the internal information from the arrays in Trend Calculus the implementation I have to present the what's happening in the middle of those bars. Hmm. Right. Yeah. Good. I mean, we, we have at most uh, four more minutes. Uh, we can always end early. Uh, are there any other questions from anyone to anyone? I think we're good. Okay. Um, maybe a, a question for me is, would you, um, I know a lot of academics would create a synthetic data set where the insights are known at the outset and then run the analysis to see if it confirms, it can identify, right, the synthetic goal. Um, is that something that you guys would entertain doing to prove anything? I think it's a nice proposal. Yeah, yeah. I don't fully understand what Tan was proposing, actually. Um, it, it's really easy. Like we use the example of the rooster and the sun. Yeah. It's a synthetic example, right? Yeah, yeah. We know that there's a relationship. It's a leading indicator because we know how roosters work, not that yeah. they cause the sun to go up. So if you were to create synthetic data sets oh, yeah, yeah. where there's hidden insights built into your data generation process, yeah. if the algorithm can uncover them, it's yeah. a good algorithm. If it can't, it's not sensitive enough. Yeah, of course. It's like what we do for causal yeah. discovery algorithms. Generate uh, well, tags and sample from them and try and learn. I guess we, we because as practitioners, we're always working with data and we have no idea where it comes from and we have to explore it and come up with insights. Yeah. I don't have the benefit of um, working with synthetic data sets I trust. But if you're using those for causal studies and other, other areas, I would uh, pit our stuff directly against the benchmark. 
I'd yeah, like to know how it benchmarks. So where can you get this? Um, yeah, this is simulated. <laughs> I mean, I think it would have been really nice if Virginia showed the test data set. So we have a synthetic data set. Is it an owl that hoots and the sun rises, doesn't rise, whatever? So we have something very babyish. Yeah. But, right. I mean, I personally, uh, at this point, I'm personally, I, I, I don't think we have the energy to invest in a, in a proper simulation. And my big problem with simulation and confirming if, if the algorithm can capture it beyond testing and stuff for software is that uh, it's not like a, 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 a yeah, it, it's it's not a non-parametric L1 approach like this. this is what my yeah. weird decision theoretic school I come from, a paranoid school, but that's my personal preference. But yeah. but Virginia, we have a few minutes. Could you show the the little example that we rolled just to confirm with Andrew and you know whether our intuitions are correct about how that is supposed to work? Oh, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah, so um, I have a um, CSV file with the events. I have like, I can show you them here. I have them here. For example, I have um, the sun and the rooster and they overlap. Then I have the sun and the rooster, but with other, uh, and another, no, this one are not, well, <laughs> here. With the yeah the rooster and the sun uh, overlapping in one day, for example, then the the rooster and the sun overlapping in a different day with different. Can you scroll uh, down a little bit and show maybe the table output of the CSV file while you're talking? Because if you're sharing another screen, that's not shared here. It's only seeing the browser window. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I uh, was showing you. Yeah. Yeah, you have to okay. share your whole screen or something if you want to do that. Wait, I need to stop. <laughs> Screen. Can you see now? Yay. Hey, okay, sorry. <laughs> so yeah, three, uh, ID three, for example, means uh, rooster and one means sun. So we have rooster and sun overlapping in one day. Then we have, again, uh, rooster and sun overlapping in a different day. Then we have uh, dog and sun that are not overlapping and so on. Uh, we have, for example, the owl and the moon that are overlapping. And then we have. Um, so we added the owl hoots and the moon rises, or something. Or I don't know, something. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> yeah, so we read it here. Um, we create the 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 RDB here, the class event. Um, then we call the rooster. That finds all the. So there are, um, there are some well-known leading indicators that could create something. So beyond the toy example and moving to finance, um, there are things like um, the international shipping rates. Um, so that's the amount of cargo moving between China and the rest of the world, if you can imagine. Oh, that um, would be very interesting, actually. Yeah, um, and they have a time series um, uh, the Baltic Shipping Index, I think it's called. Oh, wow. And the Baltic okay. Shipping Index is um, usually precedes a, uh, a bear market or, or, you know, a bear market by about three months. So a drop or rise in that. So that's something that has, um, it's a, it's a well-established market indicator. Um, and you might want to look at something that's um, really well known and then see if Pathogen works with that. Okay, can we? Can she just finish her example quickly? Yes, in the next few minutes, can you continue? What did yeah, you yeah, we apply the rooster, then we call the sun, um, and yeah, we have the vertices of the um, of the graph that show us, for example, um, for example, with the sun, uh, which has uh, ID one. We have the values for aggressiveness and sensitivity with a value, but for example. It means that it is cause and it costs other events. But for example, for event seven, which is a random event that does not uh, overlap with any of the other, we have value zero, which I think that makes sense because it doesn't cause or is not caused by, but by any of the other events. 
So That's anyway, right. we just wanted to do some very simple, yeah. you know, it's, it's for a unit test actually, and also understanding what, uh, what uh, Antoine was on about. Mm -hmm. um, so in the, I, I got the Baltic uh, ship, shipping index. Thanks for that, Andrew. So in the, just in the, in the last minute, uh, our plan for the next fortnight is basically to, uh, to use your insights with the stream order and then try and try and basically project the time intervals of two time series somehow, and then and then ensure that the time interval widths are somehow in a in a in a reasonable range, right? And that in turn hopefully will do something with that. Jim, we'll just play yeah. with this idea. Yeah. All right, right. Uh, let's uh, let's say uh, uh, over and out because we have a party starting in one minute. So yeah. have, we'll have a great time at your uh, party. And um, all everyone, guys, you can get back in touch with me. Yeah. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.